Hello everyone, my name is Mario Martinez and this is Amateur EMS. So today we're going to be talking about albuterol. So what is albuterol and why do we use it? Well, albuterol is a medication that acts as a beta-2 adrenergic agonist commonly used as a bronchodilator. Now this is a really fancy description, but what do we mean about this? How can we break it down a little bit? Well, First, we can look at the term bronchodilator. So what does bronchodilator mean? Well, we can break this down into two different aspects. The first being the bronco. And the bronco is referring to either the bronchus, such as the right primary bronchus, which is bigger of the two, or the left primary bronchus, or the bronchioles. And dilator, right here, simply means to dilate or to widen or to open up. So we're trying to open up the bronchioles or the bronchus. That way we can allow air to pass through from the trachea to our bronchus, to our bronchioles, all the way down to our alveoli, which is right here, where gas perfusion can take place. So now we have to start to look at some more complicated terms. So for the beta-2 adrenergic agonist, we're gonna start off by looking at beta-2 and if you get confused, by the way, with beta-1 and beta-2, you think of beta-1 as the heart and beta-2 as the lungs because there's one heart, there's two lungs. So beta-2 is the receptors that initiate a cascade leading to the relaxation of smooth muscles. This is caused by inhibiting the release of calcium around the smooth muscles, thereby inducing smooth muscle relaxation. So all of this is saying is that for beta-2, there are receptors that uh, are inhibited uh, of releasing calcium around the smooth muscles, causing the smooth muscles to relax. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. The second step, or the second part of this, is adrenergic, which that term just means they are receptors that respond to neurotransmitters. In this sense, the neurotransmitter is the calcium. An agonist is a substance that activates or stimulates a receptor when it binds to it. So again, it's talking about the stimulation of a receptor. In this one, it's a beta-2 receptor. So they all kind of fall in line of each other. These two terms correlate to this term right here. So before we get into the nitty gritty of what smooth muscle relaxation is, we need to understand uh, how does the smooth muscles contract in the first place? Now, looking at the body, we generally have a, a fairly strong immune system where if our body comes into contact with different pathogens or things of that nature, we'll be able to elicit a strong immune response where we'll have a fever, something along that lines, white blood cells, neutrophils, all of those will come into contact with the bacteria or whatever the pathogen is. And over time, with the combination of T and B cells, we'll be able to take care of whatever our pathogen is. That's good. But there are special exceptions in our body. So we have amino privilege sites, such as our eyes, our genitalia, things like that. But for our lungs, these are what we call immune dampen sites. Or basically, our immune system isn't kicked up to full gear, such as if we're being exposed to pathogens throughout our different tissues. So uh, these irritants that our lungs may come into contact with are things like dust mites, molds, pollen, smoke par particles, and just general pollutants. Uh, now, instead of eliciting a huge systemic immune response where our body's trying to combat this in any way possible, instead, it generally just relies on the mucus elevator where we produce mucus around our bronchial things along those na uh, that nature, and it slowly starts to come up and we end up eventually building up our mucus towards our throat. We start packing up mucus where we basically trap those irritants and are expelling them before they cause any real issue. We also need to note that with increased exercising, we have increased respirations where we're breathing in more and this causes us to come into contact with these different, uh, different irritants. So normally this is how the body works. We don't really have any issues with this, but for asthmatic patients or patients who have asthma, their body reacts too well, or they have too strong of an immune system. So basically what I mean by this is they will, an asthma patient for instance, will breathe in some of these irritants that I described earlier, and they'll say, hey, something's going on here, we're being exposed to something really bad, we need to 
stop this from reaching our lungs any further. So our body will start to contract the smooth muscles around our airway. It'll overproduce mucus. And so you'll have your bronchial, it'll start to contract. You'll have more mucus production around the area. Suddenly you have this really narrow, tight passageway for air to pass through. And our body doesn't realize this, but it's actually potentially going to kill us unless we take something like asthma, which trigger, triggers the cascade system of the beta-2 receptors that eventually inhibits calcium, which causes smooth muscle relaxation. So now that we discussed this, I'm gonna go into more of the uh, biochemistry side of this. All right, everybody, so before I talk about smooth muscle contraction, this took me a lot longer to figure out than I uh, foresaw initially. Uh, just because I didn't realize that there's a huge difference between skeletal muscles contracting and smooth muscles relax, uh, contracting. And with that, with uh, skeletal muscles, you have troponin, things like that are being activated. Smooth muscles don't have troponin, or more so there's a different function to it. But anyway, so first we get exposed to an allergen or an irritant, right? This irritates the lungs. And B cells recognize this allergen or irritant. The B cells will then release IgE, which kind of looks like a weird shaped Y, but we know this as immunoglobulin E. Immunoglobulin E gets exposed to mast cells as well as basophils, and both of these will release histamines. Histamines bind to the H1 receptors on smooth muscle cells, but this isn't all there is to it. So once they bind to smooth muscle cells, the H1 receptors uh, are coupled with G proteins that activate phospholipase C, also known as PLC. Now PLC catalyzes, or it starts or accelerates, inositol triphosphate, which is IP3, from phospholipids. And IP3 will bind to the sarcoplasmic reticulum causing a release of calcium into the smooth muscle uh, cell cytoplasm. Basically, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is what contains uh, most of your calcium. Of course, it can, can come from different sources as well. And it gets released or reuptakes the calcium depending on the muscle's need. So in this case, it's releasing the calcium into the smooth muscle cells cytoplasm. The calcium will, bound, will bind to calmodulin forming a calcium comodulin complex. Now this does two things. First, this complex binds to its, uh, binds to calconin, stopping its inhibition. At the same time, it also activates an enzyme called the myosin light chain kinase. Now this is really important. The myosin light chain kinase, also known as MLCK. And MLCK phosphorylates myosin allowing it to attach to actin, causing smooth muscle contraction. So that's generally the whole process of that. It's really important that we remember MLCK because that's going to come into huge place whenever we use albuterol to treat the asthma. Now that we have a deeper understanding of how smooth muscle contracts, we can start to delve into how albuterol works causing smooth muscle relaxation. So we inhale albuterol, which is a beta-2 adrenergic agonist. And whenever we inhale beta-2 uh, adrenergic agonist, such as albuterol, it binds to a G-protein coupled receptor, uh, like the one drawn here. Now this one, it looks pretty complex. Don't worry about it. Just know that there's an alpha subunit here and that there's a GDP, right? And the beta-2 agonist will start off by binding here. And this is located all on the smooth muscle uh, exterior. So beta-2 uh, binds to a G-protein coupled receptor, and this hydrolyzes GDP and the alpha subunit, and it converts it to just the alpha subunit being basically dislodged by itself with GTP. The alpha subunit and the GTP will bind to adenocyclase, which will activate cyclic AMP, and the cyclic AMP P will bind to PKA, and PKA, or I just read it off of here, so it activates cyclic AMP, which binds to PKA, which inhibits 
M-L-C-K, like we talked about er earlier, myosin light chain kinase, which inhibits MLCK phosphorylation of the myosin, stopping smooth muscle contraction. So this is actually how albuterol works in our body. All right, so we finished talking about smooth muscle relaxation, smooth muscle contraction. We talked about albuterol, what it does. Let's talk about the actual medication. And also just note, this is the protocols for Anadol Fire Department. This may not be the protocols that you work under. Please check your local protocols. Things can change over time. Who knows how long it'll be if you uh, are checking this video out. So uh, do not follow this protocol. Follow your own protocol uh, dedicated by your medical director. So for albuterol, the adult dose for Anadol is five milligrams per six mLs with a max dose of 15 milligrams. Uh, this can be kind of confusing because it's almost a two part where you have the milligrams and the milliliters. That's because right here I have albuterol. If you wanna take a quick look at it, it comes in this liquidy solution. And we're gonna go more into detail about this in a bit. And with any liquidy solution, what you need to think of is uh, if you're drinking a type of drink that's a powder, like pre-workout for instance, First, you get your powdery drink and you pour it in a cup. So first, it's all just a clump of powder, right? And then whenever you pour in water and you shake up your bottle, what happens to that powder? Well, it dissolves and it equally distributes throughout the liquid. And as long as you put enough solution in there, it's gonna be just a liquidy drink that for pre-workout or for whatever, will give you energy. The same thought process happens here. So. With every ampule or a vial, not ampule, of uh, albuterol, you will get 2.5 milligrams per 3 ml, right? So this is 2.5 milligrams per 3 ml. So if I wanted to administer the adult dose to a patient, I would use two of these. You always want to check uh, what the actual dose is whenever you're looking at your medications. It may end up being a bigger uh, dose than what you initially thought. So always double check it, check expirations, go through the five rights. Uh, but when we look at a pediatric patient, the dose is basically cut in half. So it's 2.5 milligrams per three mLs. Or for three mLs of solution, there's 2.5 milligrams of the medication in there. With the max dose being cut in half of 7.5 milligrams. Now generally you wanna wait about five minutes or so for the medication to kick in before you administer the next dose. You also wanna recheck vital signs every time as well. What's really interesting about albuterol is that there aren't any allergies to the medication. And also, you're gonna increase your patient's heart rate. It's really important to check your patient's vital signs before and afterwards. And there'll be times where you're walking to an ER, your patient appears slightly tachycardic, and the ER staff might ask why. And you can explain to them, oh, I administered albuterol. What does that mean? And they can yeah, ask you that because sometimes they might get confused as well. They say, well, this medication in potentially increased my patient's heart rate a little bit. They might have jittery teeth or something along those lines. And, uh, but with that being said, this is generally most standard albuterol doses. Sometimes certain agencies will mix albuterol and atrovent together. I don't really care to do that too much. Uh, but again, do whatever your medical director says but I'm concerned about atrovent potentially having an allergy where some types or forms of atrovent will have a peanut mix with them. And so if I had a choice between choosing albuterol, which doesn't have any allergies, or atrovent, which in some scenarios has a peanut allergy, which is fairly common in America, um, I would rather just do the one that doesn't have any allergies. But um, it's always important, important to ask your patient if they have any allergies, just in case something happens later and they become unconscious, and you need to administer other drugs, you uh, didn't miss out on checking this off whenever you gave the first dose of your albuterol. Okay, so just to go over some of the medication and the way we can utilize medication, uh, this is albuterol again. You can see it comes in this container. It's a liquid mix with some powder, but you can't really see the powder anymore because it's dissolved. They usually come inside a package like so, Make sure that it says albuterol, not atrovent or a different type of medication. You generally want to keep these in the uh, package, or at least if you open it, try to keep them in their own separate spot, just because you don't want to mix them with any other medications. Now, these medications are administered using a nebulizer set. 
And you can see here, we have our nebulizer set. It comes with three pieces, our oxygen tubing, our nebulizer mask. This is a small one, it's a pediatric one. And here is our container where we can connect this to a mask, like so. You can see, fits in right here onto the patient. And this piece has two different sections. There is the O2 section, where we have a little opening here. And this can be kind of intimidating for students, but you connect it like so, and you can connect this to an O2 tank, and you wanna set it at six to eight liters per minute. The reason why you wanna do this is because if you administer too much oxygen or too little oxygen, it might not properly aerosolize the medication that creates a fine mist that patients can breathe. So no for nebulizers, six to eight liters per minute is what you wanna set it at. And then also right here, so you have the oxygen tubing connected like so, and on the top part, this is where we would open up the medication and we would pour it into this slot right here, this opening. This holds the medication while the oxygen comes in and it slowly aerosolizes the medication. Again, it creates this fine mist that our patients can breathe and that goes through the whole process of eventual smooth muscle relaxation causing bronchodilation. All right, everybody. Well, this will conclude my talk about albuterol. It ended up taking a lot longer than I thought it would, but I'm glad to go over some of the mechanisms. Um, if you believe that I misspoke in any way, please let me know. You can leave a comment or something. I, I'll always check them out and read them. Uh, but I, I feel like I hit just about every topic I could think of. Uh, and if you think that I did some, said something wrong, please let me know. I can just suggest it or make some little citations about it. But uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you later. Thank you.